So we might as well go for it because that'll <clears throat> give us some <clears throat> more time for uh, discussion at the end. I, <clears throat> I don't want to take up the entire uh, time slot <clears throat> with just uh, my, my lecture. I'd like to have a discussion with Bob Harper, and <clears throat> myself, and Mark, uh, taking your questions, asking you questions, maybe. <clears throat> but uh, I, I would like to first see if you have questions about the first lecture. That's, that's what, there's the outline of it. Then I'll show you um, the, the proof, or uh, if everybody got it, maybe I, I won't show the proof. I'll give um, Jake's verbalization of it, because it's really excellent, uh, better than Brower's, so I won't read uh, Brower's for you. I'll read Jake's instead. Um, then I'll talk a little bit more about partial types. You, so you just heard a tour de force lecture uh, from Mark on our theory of what we call uh, constructive domain theory, uh, built on the partial types in New Pearl. Uh, we've been at this for <clears throat> many, many years, inspired by Edinburgh LCF, which couldn't get a good induction principle, and I think that's why uh, we, we don't use that logic, the LCF logic, and I don't know whether our domain theory will be used, but it's there. Then we'll uh, talk about the Bloom size theorem because that relates um, a partial type theory like New Pearls to uh, Koch, a total type theory, and I think it's an interesting um, result that, that explains why some Koch uh, programs are very long compared to the corresponding New Pearl program. And I don't know whether we'll have time for these last two bits. We'll see how it goes. Um, I, I wanted to talk about how we might do set theory in, uh, <clears throat> in this context. And uh, algebraic data structures are a very good example of, of dependent records. Another contribution of uh, Alexei Kopilov, who um, was responsible for a, a lot of the ideas that you heard about here. Uh, he's still doing type theory. They, they created the image type, Jason and uh, Kopilov, when they were at Caltech. OK, so that's the plan, and my guess is we'll, I'm, I'm hoping we'll get at least there. But we'll see how things go. So starting off, does anybody have a question about uh, lecture one and its summary up there? If there's something that's really on your mind, uh, bothering you, or anything like that? Yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> we start from an untyped programming language, unlike Koch, which starts <clears throat> with a typed language, right? And <clears throat> that comes from the lambda calculus. Already, there were two ways of dealing with the lambda calculus. One <clears throat> was to start with untyped terms, a la Curry, and then put the types on. Or <clears throat> Church did it by actually writing the types, if you like, so he would maybe have something like that, saying this is a type, <clears throat> this belongs to uh, the type alpha, arrow alpha. So that, that would have been the Church way of doing it. Uh, <clears throat> we were, I, I was an undergraduate student of Church's. I admired him a lot. He, uh, he guided my career from when I was a young whippersnapper there. But I disagreed with him about this when I got mature enough. When I was an undergrad, everything he said was absolute truth. The Bible, I, I took notes like mad and believed everything. But, and, and indeed, uh, the Lambda Calculus <laughs> turned out to be a, a, a brilliant thing but he didn't know, uh, know that. He didn't know how successful it was going to be. And I mentioned this story 
before that, uh, Gödel hated it and said, Poof, Turing machines are the right way to go. But as Bob likes to say, I mean, how many programming languages are built on the Turing machine? And um, so we know the lambda calculus worked. And I think McCarthy, um, he, he got it right. Lisp is built on the lambda calculus. And McCarthy was a Princeton student and did take Church's logic course and knew the lambda calculus from Church. Uh, but I, I think he didn't take Church's type theory course, and that's why he didn't put types on it. I, I don't know. He, he, he was there, but his insight was absolutely right, I think. So Lisp um, gets along very well without types. And <clears throat> you could say uh, New Pearl was inspired by, by uh, Church and McCarthy and so forth. And, and also by uh, Per Martin Lofts, uh, all starting with untyped terms as well. So does that answer your question? So we, we want to start with the untyped calculus, and it can do all kinds of amazing things, right? You can get the, you, you can define natural numbers, right? The church numerals. You can define the fixed point operator. And indeed, Curry was doing it all with his combinators, too. And we, didn't talk much about that, but I, I assume you all know that the SK combinator base is enough to define all the lambda terms, right? That, that's the, one of the universal bases, uh, uh, combinators. And the beauty of the combinators is they don't have ver bound variables. They, don't have, they have free variables, but no bound variables. So you don't have to worry about renaming alpha, conversion, capture, and all that. Um, <clears throat> but most people don't like to program in the combinator calculus with just two uh, combinators. But there are people, there's a very good uh, programming language uh, professor, uh, Mayor Gold at uh, Ben Gurion University, who programs with combinators. And he's got these eight basic combinators that, that he uses to write his programs. I mean, it's like unbelievable. There are probably 10 people in the world who read his papers. And he tries to get me to be the 11th, but it's the combinator base is too hard. Uh, uh, and the Burroughs, I mentioned, uh, Mark knew that the Burroughs architecture was built on combinators. Uh, Mark could tell you he, he verified uh, part of the Burroughs machine. And of course, in terms of universal uh, bases, there, there's, there's the Rosser basis for all of computing. It has just one combinator, the X combinator. That's all you need to define every uh, recursive function. So what does that mean? It means, well, everything is there. You, you're going to have the long thing. But the whole uh, structure of it will be determined by where you put the parentheses. So parentheses essentially are the basis of, uh, of computation. That, that, so that isn't a widely known fact. It should be better known. This was dreamt up by J. Barclay Rosser, who uh, Kleene always said, uh, Rosser wrote my PhD thesis. and. Rosser says Kleene wrote his. They were buddies together in graduate school, and they went on to Wisconsin together. And uh, everybody, this is a, a thing about academia. Everybody knew Rosser was the smartest guy they ever met. And Kleene said that. And Ro Rosser was just unbelievably quick, boom, like that. He could get anything. And, uh, but we never saw this. We heard, you know, how graduate students are. We, we heard all these rumors. Yeah, Rosser is, don't, you don't want him on your PhD committee. He was on mine. I was scared to death. But um, Rosser never said much. He sat in the back of the logic seminars until one day a, a Berkeley professor who will be unnamed was sketching the whole theory of forcing. And he was just blowing us away. No, nobody was understanding anything. And he was trying to show us how much we'd have to read his papers. So he's going on and on. And he says, well, here's a, the important theorem, but I don't think anybody will want to see the proof. Rosser raises his hand. He said, yes, I, I have some question about the statement of that proof. And he says, 
really? He said, yes, I do. And he asked the question, a really hard, deep question. Nobody else in the room had any idea what was going on. So, so then we started to think, whoa. <laughs> and for the set theorists, one day we came to the logic seminar. There's a big note on the board, uh, seminar canceled. Michael, Michael Morley discovered a contradiction in ZFC. They're all in Jay Barkley's office trying to figure out what to do. So <laughs> we, we, we uh, the graduate students who were doing set theory were panicked. You know, like their theses are almost done and they think, oh my God, it's done. You know, my contradiction. So they wanted to go for beers. So we all went out for a beer and let them moan and ask, what are we going to do now? And should we switch to recursive function theory? And those of us who were doing recursive function theory were smug, like, oh, <laughs> fine. And we were glad that we were based on cleany stuff, you know, numbers, codings, functions. It seemed safe. So that's a long answer to your question there. <laughs> It's safe. <laughs> it's safer. Nobody's going to say that computation system is inconsistent, right? They might say it's inefficient or whatever. But if you start with axioms, ZFC, somebody like Jay Barkley Rosser might someday say, you know, guys, it just ain't true. <laughs> and then you're stuck. OK, so that was a long uh, answer to a question here. Maybe I. Yep. And then you have the primitive, like the, the squiggly left hand, right? That would be like the two primitive. Yeah. Yep. And that uh, primitive there that Mark talked about, the Howe's squiggly quality, we call it, uh, it took us a long time to get to that. We had New Pearl without it, and we had what we call direct computation rules. And it was very hard to do proofs because you were constantly having to show that one thing was computationally equal to another thing. And it was driving us nuts. And I was one of the early users. And I kept complaining, you guys, we have to fix this. We need more of these rules. And then all of a sudden, Howe comes in and says, don't worry. <laughs> Everything is computationally equal. Here's the relation. And he sketched in a seminar this paper. And we were so relieved. And he submitted it to Lix. And then is where the name Howe's trick came in, because Andy Pitts had been thinking about this. He wrote me an email saying, Oh my God, how did Howe ever figure this out? And you have to read his paper. It's a beautiful paper, as Mark points out, but very, very uh, subtle insight to get that. And it's widely known there as Howe's trick, but it, it isn't uh, so much of a trick when you look at his, when you look at his paper. And, and that's absolutely a sound, correct thing. Um, so you're right, we're built on that, the house wiggle relation over untyped uh, terms. OK, that was a very long answer, but it was a very uh, good question about what is the basis of everything we do. It's a computation system. OK, any others? OK, yeah, yeah. It's called uh, a lazy computation. Uh, what, if you go to the New Pearl webpage, we have all of our papers listed. If you just do alphabetical under how, it was 1987 uh, LICS. And I think it's equality and lazy uh, lambda calculus. OK, anything else? All right, so uh, let's see how uh, I'll, I'll read you Jake's uh, really nice summary uh, of, of why this is true. Uh, Brouwer did the same thing. Brouwer di didn't write down uh, a form formal proofs. You know, for him, they were mental constructions. And if, if his mind understood them, it wasn't necessary to be more careful. So he, he also just uttered something. But it wasn't as good as what Jake uttered. Um, how, how many of you got, got it, by the way, or tr tried? Looked at it. OK, well, that, that's nice. Uh, OK, so here's what Jake said. Given a proof of not, and, and what he means, uh, assuming, uh, assuming not p or not p, we can prove 
not p. Because if, if we had p, we'd know p or not p. And so assuming, assuming p, we would know p or not p, but we're, but, but we're assuming not that. So you get a contradiction. So there it is. That's, pardon? <laughs> yeah, it's not, so, so yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write the, you could send your, your uh, sentence to everybody there, but I, I took down exactly what he said. But let's do the proof, and then we'll translate what he said into the proof, okay? Is that what you wa wanted? Or do you just want me to say it again more slowly? <laughs> okay, yeah, so given a <clears throat> proof of, suppose you know not p or not p, then if you assume p, you're going to say, well, that, that can't be right because I'm, I'm assuming not. So, so p, if you had p, you would know p or not p, but we're assuming that's wrong. So from assuming p, you get not p. You get false. So there we know. Now we've just got a proof of not p. So that says you can't have not p or not p, so you're going to get not not p or not p. OK? Did I do it right? Yeah. So OK, so some people are just, they intuit these things. And Brouwer intuited it. I, I, I didn't intuit that proof. I, I wanted to see what I'm going to show you now. I wanted to see, well, how do you prove this thing? But that intuition is exactly right. And some people just think that way. That's not exactly how it got built. I actually just opened it up in Access. Mm -hmm. Oh, really formally, and oh, oh, like, oh, okay. So okay, Brower didn't do that. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, he he didn't do that. He. Brower's a better mathematician. Uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I I just asked Jake. Uh, he we were talking about this, and I asked him, did he have a verbal account? And I made it an, an unfair assumption that he hadn't yet done the proof. <laughs> so, okay. So from the proof, then maybe everybody will will see it this way. So. Let's do it in the style here of, OK, there's the turn style. And, and <clears throat> we're going to try to prove not not p or not p. <clears throat> OK, so how do you do that? This, uh, what, what, what does all the not not stuff mean? Let's just do the first uh, one. So that, that's saying this implies false. So that, that's what we're reading. So uh, the way you do this is going to be with a lambda now, where, where we're assuming not p. So over here, we say, all right, well, not, maybe just call it n for not. <clears throat> so we're going to say, well, let, let's suppose we have this assumption that not p or not p, <clears throat> and we're trying to prove false. OK, so we've got that part. And now it's pretty clear that the only thing we can do, let, let's expand this thing now. So this is saying if I have p or not p, um, I, that, that's going to imply false. So you can see that what you want to do, the only thing you can do really is to say, well, let, let me uh, use this, right? I better use that hypothesis. So how can you use it? Well, you can apply that. So you'll apply n. And uh, when you do, you're going to have to give uh, an input there. So your goal, after you say that's what you're going to do, is going to be to prove p or not p. That'll be your goal. But uh, sometimes we write this rule by saying, all right, once you've uh, proved the goal, you're going to get uh, a hypothesis here. I I'm, I'm sorry, you're going to get a conclusion from that. And that conclusion will be bottom. Uh, so you're going to have something after you've actually proved this and stuck this in. Then the application of that function to this argument is going to give you bottom. And that's the goal here. I don't have to use x fault so quod libit or anything. That's just what I'm trying to prove, right? So I, I get that. All right, so now uh, what are we going to do? And here's the, the key insight. Well, 
I, I want to prove this. Well, I, I, you can't do anything if you tried to go for that thing. There's nothing to work with. So you better try uh, to, to go for the in right. So you say, I, I'm going to try to prove in right of this thing. So that, that tells you <clears throat> that you get to assume P, and then you're going to try to prove false. So that, that's what the in right thing allows you <clears throat> to do. Um, OK, so now, now what do you do? Uh, at least you have some information, but you still have this hypothesis around. This comes down here. So you can say, well, we're not going to, I need room now, so we'll just uh, leave this at the bottom. V, we'll leave bottom there at the bottom. OK, so now what, what can you do? You can try this again. So you'll say, well, I'm going to apply uh, n. I'll do the same sort of thing. So now I have to prove p or not p again. And uh, I've got to put that in. But now you've got p as a hypothesis here. So the right thing to do in this case is to say, yeah, I know. I'm going to do the in left. And uh, so you say that that'll be in left of, of hypothesis p. That's going in there. So <clears throat> now, now you're done, right? We've done the whole thing because uh, you, you can now just uh, take this proof and write out the, the mental construction, right? The, the thing that you would keep in your head as the uh, extract of, of this proof. So you might want to do that. I don't know whether I wrote it down, but it, it would be an interesting thing. No, I didn't. So you should just write.